What you are about to see is true. It is a matter of public record. He has been president 11 months. He is assumed by most to be dying. He has a constant painful headache and a hacking consumptive cough caused by years of tobacco chewing. He suffers from diarrhea and dropsy is causing his head literally to enlarge. This is soon to spread to his face. A bullet lodged in his left arm makes it nearly worthless. He also carries another bullet. It lies against his heart. He is a frontiersman and a great military hero. He first achieves fame in the battle against the Creek Indians in which successful war he commands a brigade of loyal Cherokee Indians. Cherokees. President Jackson, we understand you legally adopted a Cherokee boy. Then you're wrong. It was a Creek. His parents were killed in the battle. He's dead. He died. To the Aborigines of the country, no one can indulge a more friendly feeling than myself. I'll go further in attempting to reclaim them from their wandering habits, and to make them a happy and prosperous people. But, sir, the southern tribes aren't wanderers. The Cherokees haven't moved for at least a thousand years. Recently, they've mingled with the whites and made much progress in the arts of civilized life, their constitution, their supreme court. They have attempted to erect an independent government within the limits of the state of Georgia. The constitution declares that no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state. If, if the general government is not permitted to tolerate the erection of a confederate state within the territory of one of the members of this union, her consent. Much less could it allow a foreign and independent government to establish itself here. Then the southern Indians are lost. If they remain suggest for your consideration my recommendation to Congress set apart an ample district west of the Mississippi guaranteed to the Indians for as long as they shall occupy it there they be secured in the enjoyments of governments of their own choice subject to no other control from the United States other than necessary to Preserve peace at the frontier. They're the benevolent. They endeavor to teach them the arts of civilization. And by promoting union and harmony among them, to raise up an interest in commonwealth, destined to perpetuate the race and test the humanity and justice of this country. If they remain within the states, then they must be subject to state laws. Your time is up. But, sir, it's my understanding George is about to pass very special laws to harass the Indians. That's just big water. They don't have to. Talk to the governor there, Mr. Gilmer, or 
Senator Lumpkin, two of the most able and respected men in the state. Senator Wilson Lumpkin, 46 years old, elected to the Congress two years before. An early supporter of Andrew Jackson. He sits on the Joint Congressional Committee on Indian Affairs and is more than instrumental in pushing through federal legislation that legally implements Jackson's policy of Indian removal. More than any other man, it is Wilson Lumpkin, now Senator from Georgia, soon to be Governor of Georgia, who carries with him the destiny of the Cherokees residing in the sovereign state of Georgia. Georgia, sir, is one of the good old 13 states. She entered the Union upon an equal footing with any of her sisters. She claims no superiority, but contends for equality. Have you uh, met their chief? John Ross? No, sir, not yet. Well, my friend, from what I have seen, I conclude that but a very small portion of the real Indians are in a state of improvement, whilst their lords and rulers are white men. And the descendants of white men, like Chief Ross, enjoying the fat of the land, enjoying exclusively the government annuities upon which they foster, feed, and clothe the most violent and dangerous enemies of our civil institutions. The inhumanity of Georgia, so much complained of, is nothing more nor less than the extension of her laws and jurisdiction over this mingled and misguided population who are found within her acknowledged limits. It is high time these unfortunate people should know their destiny plainly and positively. Pages may be filled with a sublimated cant of the day and in wailing over the departure of the Cherokees from the bones of their forefathers. But if the heads of these pretended mourners were water, and their eyes were a fountain of tears, and they were to spend days and years in weeping over the departure of the Cherokees from Georgia, yet they will go. I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and henceforth you shall be called Sarah. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Be ye thankful. And whatsoever ye do in the word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. These three are now received into the love and care of the church in the good hope that hereafter they may never be. These three are now received into the love and care of the church. May they be kept steadfast in their love and service and continue Christ's faithful servant until their life's end. You bet your missionary ass, Reverend. New Achota, Georgia, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. The man is Samuel Austin Worcester, missionary from New England. 
His impact on the Cherokee Nation to which he is to devote his life is immeasurable. The Cherokees call him the messenger because he has something to say. But Samuel Worcester is revered not wholly for his religious teachings. It is Worcester who takes the newly devised Cherokee language and gets it into print for their nation. He supervises the newspaper, translation of school and textbooks, classic literature, and the Bible into Cherokee so that the entire nation can read and learn. How long have you been here, Reverend? It was uh, four years last October since I came into the nation. How long will you be able to stay? Well, as you are no doubt aware, the state of Georgia has just passed a law to the effect that all white men of legal age residing in the Cherokee Nation must take an oath of allegiance to the state of Georgia. Will you take the oath? No, sir. I have refused to do that. That oath implies an acknowledgment of myself as a citizen of Georgia, which might be innocent enough for one who believed himself to be such, but must be perjury for one who is of the opposite opinion. It seems Congress and the state are determined to remove the Cherokees. If what I just saw is typical, do you think it is safe for them to remain here? Or wise? Well, as to whether the Cherokees are wise in desiring to remain here or not, I express no opinion. But it is certainly just, and it should be known that they do, as a body, wish to remain. It is not possible for a person to dwell amongst them without hearing much on the subject. I have heard much. It is said that the common people would gladly remove, but that they are deterred by the chiefs, especially Mr. Ross. Have you met Mr. Ross yet? No, sir, not yet. Well, it is not so. I say to you with the utmost assurance that it is not so. Nothing is plainer than that it is the earnest wish of the whole body of the people to remain where they are. They are not overawed by the chiefs. Cherokees have a concept of democracy that makes ours seem awkward. Individuals may be overawed by popular opinion, but not by the chiefs. On the other hand, if there were a chief who was in favor of removal, he would be overawed by the people. The whole tide of national feeling sets in one strong, unbroken current against a removal to the West. He's been sentenced to four years hard labor. Four years for not taking the oath of allegiance to Georgia. Four years for living and working here without a permit. But they've taken off his chains. Chota, Georgia, the Supreme Court of the Cherokee Nation. And so it begins. Listen. A nation asked it of you. Listen. Please know that I feel no hatred in my heart for any of you. And I bring you no angry words. But I would touch your hearts. For I think your hearts are good. Therefore, for your own sake as well as ours, 
I would have you listen. Please listen. Just listen to what we have to say. He is by blood seven eight Scots. If he looks white to you, you are wrong. He is more essentially Cherokee than any other living person. He is John Ross, principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. We who now come to you in weakness are the descendants of those from whom your fathers asked a little ground to give them shelter, and it was granted. And then the strangers grew and grew until they found that the land was too small for them. So we gave them more, and we gave them more and more until we found that what was left had become too small for ourselves, so we ceased to give. And then the strangers held counsel against us. They held counsel against us, for we were few and there were many. But all this you know. You know, too, that our red neighbors and brothers on every side who once filled this region are no longer to be seen. The very graves of their forefathers have been trodden by the white man whom they welcomed. Although he came with a mask on, they welcomed him. Amid the storm of his arrival, a small forest stood the desolation, and the wind is howling around it, yet it's standing. We're that small forest. We are the only embodied people now remaining of the first natives of their native land. Countless nations disappeared before the white man. Only we are left. It's this of which I would speak. There was a time when to talk after the manner of the white man, we the Cherokee were the possessors of upwards of 35 million of the finest acres in North America. Much of that which makes Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, the Carolinas and part of Virginia so precious once belonged to us. With million after million of those acres, we parted to our brethren, the whites, whom we trusted even more freely. Because some came among us and dwelt and took wives, and they formed a part of ourselves. And their children and our children were as one. I know of what I speak. Listen. Our white brethren think we're unkind to them because we won't give them the rest of our land. There are too few to fill even a small portion of the vast possessions they ho now hold. Yet they cry out for hours and say, we're so many and we have so little room. Well, we Cherokees then shake our heads and are sorry that they should be dissatisfied. But then they tell us they'll drive us away. We answer, no, you must be drunk. Look, here are our treaties with the United States. These promise us protection. That promise is a part of the payment you have given us for what you have already received from us and from our fathers. Brothers, you cannot break that promise. We know we ought to keep these promises, replies the general government of the United States. But we have difficulties of our own. Some of our people want your land, and unless they get it, they'll clamor against you. Well, brothers, if you cannot agree among yourselves, we red men are very sorry, but what have we to do in the affair? Can wrong to us make right among yourselves? Cherokees, we are answered. You're only Indians, and you cannot expect us to quarrel among ourselves over you. We know we have made promises. Oh, yes, the white man is honest and a Christian. We know we are Christian, said the white man. We know we are honest, but don't expect us to keep promises made to you. You're only Indians. Listen. Such is the condition of our affairs with your country. The state governments harass us. The government in Washington City knows this, and they answer when we show the treaties. Remove. Remove, or your treatment will be worse. Remove and we'll protect you. We strive to reason with you, but the eyes of avarice are gloating on our lands. 
and they can't see our wives and our children and the heartstrings that bind us to our sacred homes. Its coarse voice can utter but one sound. Remove. There was a great and good man once in times past, George Washington. He called us his beloved. Beloved Cherokee. Philadelphia, August 29th, 1796. Many years have passed since the white people first came to America. In that long space of time, many good men have considered how the condition of the Indian natives might be improved. And many attempts have been made to affect it. But as we see at this day, all these attempts have been nearly fruitless. I also have thought much on this subject and have anxiously wished that the various Indian tribes, as well as their neighbors, the white people, might enjoy in abundance all the good things that make life comfortable and happy. I have considered how this could be done and have discovered but one path I wish all Indian nations to walk. Beloved Cherokees, the advice I give you is important as it regards your nation, but it is still more important as an experiment of your following our civilization, studying its ways, copying its successes. For you may determine the lot of many Indian nations. And if you succeed, why the beloved men of the United States will be encouraged to give the same assistance to all Indian tribes within their boundaries. But if you should fail, your white brothers may think it vain to make any further attempts to give the same assistance to any of the Indian tribes. Beloved Cherokee, you must not fail. Have we failed? Yet while we have spoken, the autumn has deepened and the glory has departed from the forest tree. And even now the withered and many colored leaves are burning on the hills and winter comes and the leaves will be seen no more. But the fires that consume the leaves will have made the earth more fertile. And in the spring, new leaves will appear on the trees. And again, will the world look beautiful. My friends, the leafless season of our fate has come upon us. If you forget us now, the fires that consume the leaves will fell the trees also. And to our winter, there will succeed no spring. And so as the seasons work their changes in the year of our Lord, 1831, and the 55th year of the independence of the United States, the 17,000 people of the Cherokee Nation have reached their apogee. Laws have been passed that say they do not own their own land. Further, that Cherokee laws and ordinances are null and void, and that they cannot testify one way or the other in court about these issues. The President of the United States has told them he will not help them in any way. Is it supposed that the wandering savage has a stronger attachment to his home than does the settled, civilized Christian. Is it more afflicting to him to leave the graves of his fathers than it is for our brothers and children? 
rightly considered the policy of the general government toward the red man is not only liberal but generous. He is unwilling to submit to the laws of the states and mingle with the population. To save him from this alternative and perhaps utter annihilation, the general government kindly offers him a new home and proposes to pay the entire expense from the purchase of his southern lands to the cost of removal and settlement west of the Mississippi. How much? How much? How much for our tens of millions of acres? And for all the mines therein, including those of silver and gold, for the homes of more than 17,000 persons, and for all the farms they have under cultivation, and for the numberless ferries and bridges and mills, and for the cost of the removal of more than 17,000 persons to another country, and for the purchase of that country, for all these things, how much? How much? Twenty-five cents an acre to purchase all that we have here and to pay for the rebuilding of our nation a thousand miles away. We're offered twenty-five cents an acre. Of course, if we agree to remove now, we get a bonus and a special annuity for removing. Another of General Jackson's liberal and generous policies. Fifty cents per person. Well, I'll do fairly well. I manage 110 acres here. So that'll be for myself and my family, including the bonus, the special annuity for enrolling for all of us. And all of this, $31.50. Pony clubs. They come in unexpectedly. They could really just go around us, you know. There's a great deal of land out there. But they are legislating us out. Running us out. Scaring us out. Buying us out burning us out. You see, the white man really does not understand how an Indian feels about his land. The land is our church. Because our fathers are interred in it, and their fathers. It is our link to them. That is why the land is our church. Speaker of the Council, John Ridge. Full blood and friend to John Ross. Schooled in Cornwall, Connecticut, from whence he has returned with a white wife. John Ridge is one of the most able young men in the nation, assumed to have a brilliant and important life ahead.
You see, to an Indian, removal from the land of his birth is especially monstrous. Besides all the obvious losses, for it is a suppression, a denial of the specific thing that makes him what he is. It is causing among our people the abandonment of hope. And when you abandon hope, you have nothing. And when you have nothing, you are nothing. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I wonder if you do. I would understand if you did not. That is my own tragedy. I'm not certain I understand that, Mr. Ridge. I am an Indian. I have taught myself to think like a white man. My friend John Ross, he is a white man who has taught himself to think like a Cherokee. That is his tragedy. Is that fair to Chief Ross? It is what I have come to believe. I have come to believe that we must fight to keep our honor. My God, Mr. Ridge, you're outnumbered a million to one. Ah, but I do not imply an armed conflict with the United States. It will be a very different kind of battle. My son said that to you? Yes, sir. John? Yes, sir. My son is Speaker of the Council. Yes, sir, I know. My God. Hundreds will go with him. Hundreds. The nation will divide in half. My God. He signed the blood law. The blood law? I signed it too. We all signed it. Whereas, a law has been in existence for many years but not committed to writing, that if any citizen or citizens of this nation should treat or dispose of any lands belonging to this nation without special permission from the national authorities, he or they shall suffer death. Therefore, be it resolved by the committee council and general council convened that any person or persons who shall, contrary to the... You don't have to finish it, Mr. Ross. I understand. There are 20 signatures. His is a third. He also signed this one. Any person found guilty of causing rebellion against the nation shall suffer 100 lashes on the bare back. That's the whipping law, both designed for traitors. Into battle, a man can only carry a weapon and a sense of his own honor. That is all. I have fought many battles. I fought alongside General Jackson and Horseshoe Bend. I was the first one across. A general would understand, as I understand my son. The white man is coming here with his rudeness, with his whiskey, with his prostitutes. It is as certain he is coming as it is certain we are going. It is only that my son is the first one to clearly see that, to see that the white man is coming. United States Agent Benjamin F. Curry, Superintendent for the removal of the Cherokee Nation within the limits of the state of Georgia. Personally appointed by Andrew Jackson. Oh. Oh, 
All right, Peter, let's see what we've got so far. Okay. Uh, the family's enrolled. 71. Uh, the white men at head of the Indian families. 21. White women with Cherokee children. One. All right. Mixed blood head of family. That's 34. All right. Uh, total number of the white, red, and black. 336. All right. Seven days rations at seven. Six. Mr. Curry has cancer of the stomach and but a very few years to live. It is to be said after he dies, had he lived, the Cherokees would surely have killed him. $68. Oh. In 60 days, rations to mouth of White River at uh, 7 cents, or uh, 6,000 rations for each 100 Indians. 420, 420. All right, totally. Good morning, Mr. Curry. How's it coming along? Oh, slowly, sir. We have so far only about 400 enrolled for removal. It goes slowly, but it goes. $1,034. I wait uh, federal funds to pay those people for their improvements before they depart. There's been some delay. And the chiefs of the nation are telling the people that our pledges are just yours, held out to get them away from the land of their birth to a country where upon their arrival they'll receive no pay for their abandoned improvements, and where they'll be subject to the same embarrassments that they now experience. Well, furthermore, from what knowledge I have been able to derive of the Indian character, it seems to be a principle of his character to prefer one dollar on hand than ten upon trust. Well, that may have something to do with the nature of the white man and his promises rather than the nature of the Indian. I do not defend the white man. The Georgia law, which lays the Indian liable to all the pains and penalties without allowing him the benefit of his oaths in court, operates to some extent as, as an invitation to bad men to plunder. Tell me, Mr. Curry, is there a government policy here awarding Indians who enroll? Of course. Five dollars to a family, two dollars to each single adult Cherokee. More or less on the principle of enlisting soldiers. Further, I have adopted the rule of giving each unmarried male a rifle, if past the age of 18. And every grown woman over that age, and not in the care of parents, a kettle. Now, although there's no law expressly saying that this shall be done, it's considered to be right that all grown men should have a rifle, and grown women doing for themselves a kettle. All of this, of course, is over and above the 25 cents per acre that Congress has authorized. Well, that's all changed now. President Jackson has increased that by a half. By a half? So it's 37 cents an acre now? Yes, sir. That's very generous. Well, we're very pleased here that President Jackson has been re-elected. The country needs him. As we move west toward new frontiers, we need a frontiersman at the helm to guide our course. I, Andrew Jackson, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Another trip to Washington City, sir? I have no recourse. We cannot and must not lose sight of our political rights, which have been established by the laws and the treaties with the United States. It is on them solely that our security of protection hangs. I go to see General Jackson. You fought with him at Horseshoe Bend, didn't you? A thousand creeks died that day. Twenty years have now elapsed since we participated with you in the toils and dangers of war and obtained a victory over Tehaka on that memorable 27th of March. That horrible day was filled with the awful streaks of blood and death. It is in times such as these that the hearts of men can be truly tested and correctly judged. We were then your friends, Mr. President. 
and the conduct of man as an index to his dispositions. Now in a time of peace, why should not gallant soldiers who walked hand in hand through blood and carnage be not friends still? I am, Mr. Ross, exceedingly anxious for the termination of all your problems. Mr. President, we have ever enjoyed the rights and liberties of free men. God forbid that we should ever live in vassalage to any power. But if we're too weak to live as free men, then it's better that free men should die than to live as slaves. My friend, I have no motive to deceive you. I am sincerely desirous to promote the welfare of your people. Listen to me, therefore, while I tell you that you cannot remain where you now are. The fate of your women and children the fate of your people to the remotest generation depends on the issue. Deceive yourself no longer. Do not cherish the belief that you can resume your former political situation and continue your present residence. As certain as the sun shines to guide you in your path, so certain is it that you cannot drive back the laws of the state of Georgia from among you. But you could, Mr. President. You alone could drive back the state of Georgia. The fate of my people rests solely in your hands. You could do it. You could. <laughs> I will not go to war for you, John Ross. I will not go to war because of you. You will remove. We will not remove. States' rights, Mr. Ross. I will not go to war because of that either. The Federal Union, it must be preserved. There will be no war, no civil war in America. Who's talking about war? I'm talking about peace. For God's sakes, go around us and let us be. It's too late. It's too damned late, Mr. Ross. And so John Ross, principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, crosses the Georgia line into the temporary safety of East Tennessee. His people divided among themselves and battered and plagued by the gross and illegal conduct of local authorities and the federal compliance thereto. In the mountains on this night, Six Cherokee previously scattered by and hiding from the pony clubs are to die from eating poison berries. Death and the white man are indeed to arrive simultaneously. Would you say, sir, that time accurately judges a man's true role in history? Of course. For time acts as a summary of the impulses and actions that mark the man in the first place. So I don't find it a very profound question. His name is John Shermahorn. He is a former Dutch Presbyterian minister from Pennsylvania. He is here on a special mission sent by Andrew Jackson. Two years before, Mr. Shermahorn completes his first assignment for President Jackson. 
He literally tricks the chiefs of the Seminole Nation into signing a document which the federal government claims to be their agreement to remove. The result of this is the current Seminole War. Mr. Shermohan has come here to negotiate a similar treaty of removal with the Cherokee Nation. If the distance of time gives us a perspective about ourselves, what then, my friend, does the present tell us? We are here to conclude a treaty on the part of the United States, and the chiefs had men and people of the Cherokee tribe of Indians. But the principal chief is not here, sir, nor the nation. Ah, but they are. They are here by consent, for I have caused to be posted throughout their nation a notice of today's meeting with the writ that anyone not attending will be considered as voting for the treaty? Why, well, it may well be that these are the only ones opposed. For if they were for it, they need not have come. Of course, Mr. Curry promised a free blanket to anyone who did come. Perhaps they're just cold. Article 1. The Cherokee Nation hereby cede, relinquish, and convey to the United States all the lands owned, claimed, or possessed by them east of the Mississippi River, and hereby release all their claims upon the United States for the spoliations of every kind, for and in consideration of the sum of five millions of dollars. Excuse me, how much is that? That's 50 cents an acre. Oh. Now, therefore, be it known that I, Andrew Jackson, President of the United States, having seen and considered the said treaty between the United States and the Cherokee people, accept, ratify, and confirm the same. In testimony whereof, I have caused this seal of the United States to be hereunto affixed, having signed the same with my hand done at the city of Washington this 29th day of May in the year of our Lord, 1836, and at the independence of the United States, the 60th. Sir, you must know you are being denounced across the country. The treaty is called a fraud. No treaty at all because not sanctioned by the main body of the Cherokee Nation. Reverend Shermahorn's conduct has been called a betrayal of the country's trust. The North is in an uproar. Perhaps it's their turn. I have here an irate memorial from 20 citizens of Rahway, New Jersey. Would you care to read it? also been denounced by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Headquarters Eastern Division, Cherokee Agency, Tennessee. 9 a.m., May 17, 1838. 
the staff of the newly arrived commanding officer assembles for their first briefing. Lieutenant Colonel W.J. Worth, Acting Adjutant General, Chief of Staff. Gentlemen, General Scott. Good morning, gentlemen. Major General Winfield Scott, newly arrived from the Seminole War, charged by the President to cause the Cherokee Indians, yet remaining, to remove to the West according to the terms of the Treaty of 1835. Such is newly elected President Van Buren's respect for General Scott. It is said he has been allowed on this assignment to write his own orders. Well, gentlemen, the duties devolved on us here and on the district commanders are of a rather critical nature. The Cherokees, by the advances they have made in Christianity and civilization, are by far the most interesting tribe of Indians within the territorial limits of the United States. We have 12,000 of these people to remove. They have six more days in which to emigrate voluntarily. A thousand or more have gone, perhaps. But a good four-fifths remain, and they are opposed to the emigration. They will not go voluntarily. Now, none of these are in actual hostilities with the United States, or do they threaten a resistance by arms. But it is as certain as we sit here together this morning. Our troops will be obliged to cover the whole country they inhabit, to make prisoners, and to march each and every one of these 12,000 people in. Now, considering the number and the temper of the mass to be collected and removed, it will readily occur that indiscretions or acts of harshness or cruelty on the part of our troops will lead step by step to delays, impatience, exasperation, and in the end to general warfare and carnage. A result in the case of these particular Indians utterly abhorrent to the generous sympathies of the whole American people. Now if some parties here and there seem to hide themselves, they must be punished and insisted to surrender but they must not be fired upon unless they should make a stand to resist. It cannot be doubted if one gets possession of the woman first, the outstanding members of the same family will readily come in with the assurance of forgiveness and kind treatment. You wonder about this. I carry this implement with me always. This is a United States Army issue tomahawk. Issued to the soldiers for scalping Indians. It's a device they learned from the British. The British authorities used to pay their soldiers 20 pounds for the scalp of any Indian, any tribe. It also paid 10 pounds for the scalp of any Indian child any tribe, either boy or girl. General Scott is building 12 camps, stockades, concentration camps, if you will. They're open camps, open to the weather, and that's where our white brethren are putting us. And then, when we're all collected, and the whole nation is collected, save those who've gone on before us, we're to be marched, a thousand miles, we're to be marched. There are 5,000 men coming in now to round us up, soldiers, militia, guardsmen, volunteers. They form into small groups of two or three and they go out collecting Indians. They're being instructed to approach quietly 
At mealtime, for example, General Scott suggests. So in this manner, they'll take us entirely by surprise. In this considered way, your countrymen plan to remove the entire Cherokee nation. By total surprise, remove them to the West while we sit down to supper. You know the Cherokees call me Chicken Snake. Chicken Snake General Jackson. President of the United States has sent me with a powerful army to cause you, in obedience to the Treaty of 1835, to join your brethren already established in prosperity on the other side of the Mississippi. occupy already many positions in your country and thousands and thousands are coming from every quarter to render resistance and escape alike hopeless. All of our troops regular and militia, are your friends. Receive them and confide in them as such. Soldiers are as kind-hearted as they are brave. It is the desire of every one of us to execute our painful duty in mercy. of this, my Cherokee brethren. I am an old warrior and have been present at many scenes of slaughter. Spare me, I beseech you, the horror of witnessing the destruction of the Cherokees. Number one? Number one.
Give me your knife. Turn around. When Wilson Lumpkin's term of governor is up, he is appointed commissioner of Cherokee removal. And so, while Chief Ross spends most of his time in Washington City fighting the legislation of removal, Commissioner Lumpkin spends most of his time in the Cherokee Nation implementing it. Commissioner Lumpkin, would it not have been possible in some way to have let the Cherokee keep their ground without penalizing the needs of Georgia? I believe the earth was formed especially for the cultivation of the ground. And none but civilized men will cultivate the earth to any great extent or advantage. Therefore, I do not believe a savage race of heathens found in the occupancy of a large and fertile domain or country have any exclusive right to the same from merely having seen it in the chase or having viewed it from the mountaintop. Wherever a wild and savage race becomes so far reduced by a civilized people as to be considered subdued and unable to do battle with the Christian nation, immediately it becomes the duty of the superior race to look upon the inferior as children, minors, and incapable of protecting or providing for themselves. And consequently, that benevolence, humanity, and religion require the superior with magnanimity and liberality to take these orphans and minors by the hand and do them all the good the circumstances will allow.
This summer has been the driest anyone can recall. There is no water. The food issued is rancid bacon and flour. 81 people have died so far here. Measles, cholera, dysentery, confinement, and want of sanitation. This is but one of 12 similar camps. And so on July 23, 1838, the National Committee and Council of the Cherokee Nation holds its last general council in and on their native land. <laughs> They prepare a resolution proposing to General Scott that the Cherokee Nation itself undertake the whole business of removing their people to the west of the Mississippi. And General Scott agrees. Scott appoints John Ross as superintendent of removal, which causes for the first time a feeling of unanimity among the people. It further means for the first time the Honorable Wilson Lumpkin of Georgia is out of work. I am unwilling to go down to the grave with the impression resting on any portion of the public mind that my life and labors have been prejudicial to any portion of the human family of whatever complexion or origin they may happen to be. It has been my desire from early youth up to this day that at the close of my earthly pilgrimage it might be said of me in truth he served his generation with fidelity the earth is a great island floating on a sea of water suspended at each four of cardinal points hanging down from the sky vault which is of solid rock when the world grows old and worn out the people will die the cords will break letting the earth sink down into the ocean and all will be water again Originally, when all was water, the uh, animals were way above, beyond the arch. But it was very much crowded there, and they were wanting more room. The water beetle offered to go to the water bottom to see what he could learn. He dived to the bottom and returned with some soft mud which began to grow and spread until it became the island which we called the earth. The animals were anxious to, to get down. So they sent out the great buzzard, the father of all the buzzards we know now. He flew all over the earth low down to the ground and it was still soft when he reached the country here he was very tired and his wings began to flap and strike the ground wherever they struck the earth it left a great valley and wherever they went up again, there was a great mountain. But when the animals above saw this, they were afraid that the whole country would be full of mountains. So they called him back. But the Cherokee country remains full of mountains to this day. 
there is another world under this one. One that's just like ours in everything. Animals. People. Plants. Save that the seasons are different. Tomorrow, tomorrow we take a walk a long walk to this other world. We are fortunate. We shall know two worlds. Most people only see one. We are fortunate. We lost three wagons now. We had to pay $40 at the Walden Ridge toll gate. On the Cumberland Mountains, they fleeced us. 73 cents a wagon and 12 and a half cents a horse, without the least abatement or thanks. One third of the Cherokee Nation, 4,500 human beings, are to die on the Trail of Tears. Burying four or five a day now. Exhaustion and exposure, mostly. These terribly heavy winds and having to sleep on this cold, wet ground. Half these people don't have real shoes. And their moccasins just dissolve in this weather. All I can do for this child is make her as comfortable as possible. And that, in point of fact, is not possible. come halfway yet, and it's December already. I rode alongside the Cherokee during the Creek War. That was nothing compared to this. I've never seen such human hardship. taking everything. So along with everything else, we're going to get damn hungry in that damn short while. Thank you. 
averaging 11 or 12 a day. Diphtheria now and whooping cough. It's, it's the children and the old ones. I have no medicines left. It is now the middle of winter. The Mississippi is running filled with ice, unsafe for boats. The Cherokee Nation, with hundreds of sick and dying, backs up at the banks of the frozen river. The eighth president of the United States, Martin Van Buren from New York. It affords me sincere pleasure to apprise the nation of the entire removal of the Cherokee Nation of Indians to their new homes west of the Mississippi. The measures authorized by Congress have had the happiest effect. By an agreement concluded with them, by the commanding general in that country, their removal has been principally under the conduct of their own chiefs, and they have emigrated without any apparent reluctance. That is the end of my statement. Sir, the Cherokees are not there yet. I beg your pardon. They are still blocked at the Mississippi. Well, it's been a hard winter. I know what they're going through. The Baptist Mission here reports 1,200 Cherokees have died so far, just on the march. That's not possible. I don't believe that. there is to be more death. For the pro-removal faction and the Ross party have unreconciled debts. And as the Cherokee Nation slowly rebuilds in the Oklahoma Territory, the two factions fight it out till the Civil War gives them a battlefield big enough to satisfy their apparent bent toward national suicide. Big enough, finally, to put an end to it. The capital is here, Tahlequah, in the Oklahoma Territory. The Cherokees rebuild again for the second time. In the new land the United States has promised them in perpetuity, has guaranteed them forever. Here they rebuild the schools, the newspapers, the hospitals, the judicial system. 
all the specifics of a once again emergent people. In 1907, the territory of Oklahoma becomes a state, and history in its curious fashion repeats. For the sovereign state of Oklahoma decides, the Cherokee schools and hospitals, even the Cherokee insane asylum, which has one inmate, do not belong to the Cherokees, but rather to Oklahoma. And so all that they have built is taken away once again.